Welcome to Strategic Alliance Management. And this is a final video of the four part series. This last video is all about go to market with GSIs. I think the most important question that always remains is how do GSIs make money? And it's complex actually. So, which is the reason I wanted to uh, create this slide. You see, GSIs make money in different ways, but what is very fundamental for you to align with and always remember, and this is something you never ever forget, when you work with GSIs, their delivery billing is where the money comes from. So product companies can just sell a product and get the money. GSIs operate differently they'll have to deliver the services, build the customer, and then make the money. So what kind of billing or delivery billing do they typically do? One is large implementation. It can be large maintenance and support contracts. And of course, large turnkey projects given as a service go you know for customers to pay per month for example but what matters is you need to know delivery billing against SLAs is exactly where the money is and the SLAs are all in a contract here are some of the examples of GSI delivery billing I don't need to talk about it but just to give you an example Here's the first one. The second. And this is pretty common, right? This is the third one, which deals with implementation followed by maintenance and support. And this can be a consulting gig. So the most important question that we see is how GSIs see the future? What do they really look for when it comes to making money? Now this one is going to be a little complex. So I'll probably go slow, but it's hard to explain this in a video. You see, this is the organization view the way GSIs look at it. One company and you can divide or subdivide this company into functional ecosystems or functional sub-ecosystems. For example, this piece is a large function and the way customers and GSIs look at it is this is the strategic piece of that particular function. This is the controlling piece of the function. And this is the execution piece of that function. For example, let me just quickly show you just one function. Let's say HCM, you know, everybody uses it, right? So it's very easy to explain that in HCM, these are the strategic functions. These are the controlling functions. These are the operational or execution functions. Now, let me explain why uh, I, I want to illustrate this in a slide deck. Typically, what happens is that the most important piece to this function is the people. And you can see the hierarchy here or the pecking order. Different people are the users. Typically, what we know is in the market, there are multiple software like the Oracle, the Workday, ADP software, etc., etc. So software tools are critical because software tools along with the data and the data hierarchy is also very critical because you can see the data basically flows, you know, flows from the bottom to the top. And then GSIs, 
you know, basically their job is to kind of combine everything. But there's a little bit more to it. What I want to say is that product companies or SaaS companies just focus on the software. They can focus on the data. The missing element is always the process. And process is something that you always keep in mind when you work with GSIs because that's where they make the money. So GSIs make the money in multiple ways. They can implement the software and the tools. They can manage the entire data or the entire project. They can digitize the processes by tying the process into the software. And then they can combine all of this, make it into a business process outsourcing contract and give it to the customer. Most people actually think BPOs are just voice like call centers in India. The call centers in India have actually gone over to Vietnam, you know, other places, and even in Africa 20 years back. So the question is, this is the future of GSIs where they want to combine people, process, technology, offer the whole thing as a service, and BPOs are going to be very, very common. So, as I said, GSIs are all about controlling the process, not just the technology. Process as a service is what GSIs are after. If they can deliver it, they are golden. That's why we say software tools can only build and automate the processes. But the control of the processes, the efficient management of the processes, and giving it to the customer, so the customer can do their daily jobs is the biggest benefit and the need from the customer. Only the GSIs can deliver the agility with the efficiency and accuracy. Nobody else can. And that's what makes GSIs very, very critical everywhere. Now, when I say imagine the need at the customer um, or the customer requirements, you can see complexity, cost, agility, efficiency in the Fortune 500 companies is big. Look at this map over here, which we talked about. We only talked about one function, the HCM function. Now imagine this one. There's at least hundreds of these important functions in a Fortune 500 company. Imagine how complex it is when, when GSIs do business or imagine the complexity that is with the, com the customers and that is where the GSIs play. Now, the reason I say complexity and agility, you see complexity and agility are paradoxes, which means the yin and the yang. If it's too complex, you cannot be agile. And that's the reason I believe this is the biggest need and it's a paradox. If you're, you're either, most companies are either a Titanic or they are made up of 10,000 canoes. Both of these have their own challenges of complexity, cost, and agility. And only GSIs can solve this problem. So let's talk about the go-to-market with the GSIs. I'm probably going to leave, you know, a customized go-to-market out and lay out a couple of steps. If you can follow these steps and keep them in mind, all these steps typically work. I've seen this work in the last eight, nine years for sure. So let's understand that we are always talking about the business case. True, you can always talk about the customer business case with the GSIs but that's not the way they look at it. The way they look at it is exactly how you need to align. You see, any, any customer business case is fine, but it needs to clearly align with the GSIs in one way, shape, or form, which is the way they implement, the way they digitize processes, and how they manage processes. If the business case doesn't align 
with any three of these, it's hard to work with the GSIs. You'll get a lot of noise, a lot of, you know, head nods. But ultimately, you won't be successful. The only reason is you have not mapped the business case and the services based on how the GSI looks at it. So you have to go into specifics, which is what is their exact gain? How much is it? And who inside their practices gain the most? Why, why do I say this? At the end of the day, you, a product or a SaaS company, will be working with the GSI practices. Knowing the specifics is the only way to be successful. That's the reason I say the devil's always in the details when you work in strategic alliances. For example, the way you should map this is when you do a project, what is the first practice that gains from you and who are the Alliance and BizDev people? What's the second practice? What's the third practice? Who are the people who benefit from you? And the reason I want to um, exemplify, you know, this piece, if you do this wrong, the rest of the steps will always be wrong. This is the basic important piece that strategic alliance people and product sales people or SaaS sales people or even GSI biz dev people will need to consider. So what we need to do is once step one is clear, go to step two, which is the priority model, which means you need to understand which practices make the money who builds, who scopes the service, who sells, and why is that? Ensuring you find out who or who are the contributors that make the first phase, the second phase, and the third phase of the project, or it can be fourth phase or fifth phase. But you need to know who are the contributors or who, which are the practices that gain at each and every step. Why is that? Because there's always three stages of a project. There's a landing or the POC or the POV. There's an expansion. And then there's a scale stage. And let's say, let us assume that during the landing, you've got GSI practice one that is starting it, but then GSI practice two comes into the picture, followed by GSI practice three. One key element that you need to know over here is these boxes also show the volume of the services. You can clearly see that GSI practice two has a higher service than GSI practice one. So let us keep looking at this picture, which is the different practices that have to get involved to expand and scale the project. This step three is called the alignment, cause, and effect model. This is the way GSI see it. So now you realize that if this is the stages, you are aligned with GSI practice one. Let's say you're aligned with GSI practice three, so this is where you matter to the GSI practices. Let us assume this. When this happens, you always need to look at the alignment piece this way, which is you've got all the GSI practices, lay them up one by one, and then start analyzing, which means, for example, you contribute directly to this GSI practice. Similarly, it happens with GSI practice three. For GSI practice two, the GSI practices, this particular GSI practice two is dependent on you, but they enable the rest of the processes. Similarly, GSI practice four 
is kind of dependent on you. So they'll cooperate with you, but they are not going to be enabling, you know, what you're doing because they are way down the entire, you know, rabbit hole of implementation or expansion of the project. It depends, but this is how I'm looking at it. And then GSI practice five is not really dependent. They're pretty much far away from you. So now let's look at the engagement model. In the engagement model, you realize that you'll have to, you know, work with these two practices simply because you can lead with them or they can lead with you. So there's a direct relationship with these practices or these groups or capabilities or sales and biz dev or alliance leads. So that's why they are important. On the other hand, GSI practice too actually rides with you, right? So very naturally, they are not very important. So you would, you will kind of, you know, know them, but you will probably not work with them directly. And the same happens to the GSI practice four and five. You know, they are not very important. You'll probably focus on GSI practice one and GSI practice three. So let's look at the biz dev process map. So now you can see that you are going to be totally focusing your attention on GSI practice one and GSI practice three. Actually, that is incorrect. And the reason I say this is you need to understand a very critical element, which I'm going to talk about in step number six. We talked about these pieces in the last couple of slides. You see, the biggest thing that matters in this process of biz dev is that it is a continuous process. Typically, you know, as you keep going through the landing, the expansion and the scale stage, your value at the expansion will always diminish. Your value, not the GSI's value. Because you're already proving some of these in the stage, which is called landing. So this is kind of a process map of how things go. The devil's in the details here because, you see, when you build a process, time becomes a very critical element. And when time gets into the picture, your intent is totally proportional based on time. Your time determines what your motivation will be. So the practices over here are totally dependent on the process of time. So if you look at the biz dev map, the best way to work with the practices is to work with GSI practice one and two because GSI practice two actually has a bigger stake in the business. So it's a cause and effect, remember? So this is the step number seven, which means that now you know whom to work with. And you need to be very critical because, because one is dependent on the other. There's gonna be always a lot of practice conflicts between these groups. It is natural. So what do you do? This is called the conflict check model. Put these GSIs, practices, on a table, like a dashboard like this, and map them as people process technology, which means assets, people, and delivery, and see where you are mapped. The first thing is, and never forget, you need to map these technology assets between the practices so they align with you. If they are not, then GSI practice too, who's really not uh, dependent on you directly, but just enables you, they might have a competitive asset. So you gotta be very, very careful over here. If you're building the asset, remember, assets are great, but if you're not aligned, it's not gonna work. The second piece is when you talk to these people who are involved with you, be 100% clear about their roles. 
For example, if you're an Oracle sales rep, map to GSI Practice 1 or GSI Practice 3, and suddenly GSI Practice 2 comes in with an AWS asset, and GSI Practice 2 can be very um, you know, powerful because they get a larger volume, just remember there's going to be conflicts. So be very careful. You need to align all these elements, which is understand the assets, check the clarity in roles, and the last piece is you need to enable the delivery people because now there are multiple delivery people who are involved. If you're not enabling them, just the power of the people in delivery can swing your product out to a competitor. That's how people lose deals just because they don't understand one very important thing, and that is the devils and the details when you are in strategic alliances and even building assets. To conclude some of these elements that we talked about, you see, you have to build power in the go-to market. And the devil will always be in the details because the CEO view of a product and GSIs working together is pretty much like a, hey, they lived happily ever, ever after model. You know, that's, that's because the CEO's view is strategic. On the other hand, if, if you're a sales VP or an alliance VP, your idea would be the executive relationship view, and which is extremely important. If you're a strategic alliance director, I can only say that you need to have a very clear map of what are the ideas, what can be technically done, and then totally focus on the you know, devils and the details model, and then build the go to market. So I do appreciate you sticking on with me. And we are strategic alliance management, as I said, we are redefining this entire profession. I hope these videos are to your liking. I am very confident there'll be some slide or the other that's beneficial to you or for you or for your entire team. I will be building a large uh, set of videos um, which deals with different engagement models and different projects and how different GSIs behave. And we'll go down further and further into this rabbit hole. But long story short, just remember, you can transform any strategic alliance deal or convince anybody in the strategic alliance space just by showing the force of multiple alliances in an ecosystem and the power they occupy in the deal-making process. That's the only way I believe that uh, strategic alliances should be wordsmith at any level, which means strategic alliances and ecosystems create power, power, and power. Thank you.